Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is John Maynard, Senior Product Manager at Shield Healthcare. Welcome to our webinar, The Causes, Types, and Management of Urinary Incontinence. Your presenter and clinical instructor today is Kelly Sparks with Capital Nursing Education. Attendees will be in a listen-only mode. If you have a question for Kelly, please type it in the question box on the right-hand side of your screen. There's also an outline of the presentation that you can download, and if you're watching this presentation as part of a group, there are a few forms your group will need to submit to qualify for CE credits as well. At the end of the webinar, we'll tell everyone how you can qualify for CE credit for the, for the presentation. Now I'd like you to present Kelly, now I'd like to present Kelly Sparks, RN, BSN, CWOCN of Capital Nursing Education. Kelly earned her BSN from California State Dominguez Hills and is a graduate of the MD Anderson ET program. She is currently employed at Mercy Folsom and provides wound ostomy and condense care for inpatients. Kelly has also served as membership coordinator of the Pacific Coast region of the WOCN Nursing Society and is a working member of the Foot Certification Study Project of the WOCN Certification Board. At this time, I'd like to pass the presentation over to Kelly. Kelly. Good morning. Thank you very much, John. So we're going to talk about the types and causes and treatment of incontinence. And this is one of my very, very favorite subjects. So I'll try to not to get too excited during this, this um, presentation because I can really get excited about this. So the objectives, we're going to look at um, reviewing what is normal because that's important to know what is not normal and differentiate between the types of urinary incontinence, discuss the types of probable causes and multiple types of treatment of urinary incontinence. Also, we're gonna to touch on the psychosocial aspects of urinary incontinence, which is, is very, very important when it comes to these patients in this category. So the definitions of urinary incontinence are that it is unintentional loss of urine that's sufficient enough and in frequency and amount to cause physical and or emotional distress in the person experiencing it. And it's also the inability to control urination or the passage of urine. Urinary incontinence can range from an occasional leakage of urine to complete inability to hold any urine at all. And those people have a very difficult time. The prevalence and incidence, we have to go through that. We like to see that one in four women ages 30 through 59 are incontinent. When you think about the 17.8 million Americans that are incontinent and 30 to 40% of middle-aged women, 50% of older women and 56% of skilled nursing facility residents, of which 70% are women. So one third in the community are wearing products, which is why there's so many for sale in all of our stores. So looking at the types of incontinence, stress urinary incontinence, we've all heard of that, urge incontinence, mixed, functional, overflow, overactive bladder, and total incontinence. As you can see, my little acronym here is some foot. Foot has nothing to do with incontinence, but that's how I can remember it. Persistent. When you have persistent incontinence, usually that comes from sphincter weakness. Surgeries, pelvic prostate or rectal surgery, bladder spasms, um, pelvic prolapse, these are persistent kinds. Um, bladder cancer, pelvic muscle weakness, enlarged prostate, mental or um, psychological changes, impairment of the nervous system, Parkinson's, MS, people who have strokes, your spinal cord injuries. Um, there can also be nerve or muscle damage from radiation. Um, this is the persistent type. And these studies were done by Devery and Minison, and they show that older white race and obesity are particularly strongly related to the persistent type of incontinence as well. A lot of you have seen this acronym, the diapers with the extra P in it. Um, yes, the pun is intended. Delirium, infection, atrophic vaginitis, pharmaceuticals, psychological, endocrine, um, restricted mobility, and stool impaction. 
So those are the transient types. The transient types, each of which can be um, stopped sometimes to make it so that they um, do not have to be incontinent any longer. Acute incontinence, that would be when it's quick, like a stool impaction, or if a medication may have some side effects that causes incontinent. Um, inflammation of the urinary tract, that can cause incontinence. Psychological factors, polyuria, all of those things are what we would consider acute rather than um, persistent. And the psychosocial issues. I really want to touch on this because I, you know, I've had two different um, continence clinics in my career. And one of the things that I noticed is the psychosocial issues were horrendous. These people are helpless and afraid. And if you think about the humiliation, I want to just I want to just talk about what patients have said to me. Um, one of my patients had said to me that when she was she she played bridge and she was at her friend's house playing bridge and her pad was soaked and she didn't want to get any on the nice chair. So she went into the bathroom and there was no trash can in the bathroom. And even if there was, did she want to leave a wet pad in that bathroom? She was just horrified. She didn't know what to do. And she didn't have anything that she could put it in in her purse or anything. So here she is with this soaking wet pad and no place to put it. Um, that's the kind of thing that they go through. And even if there was, like I said, a trash can there, are you really going to leave it there? Um, I used to tell my patients to carry Ziploc bags with them, wrap it in toilet paper, put it in your Ziploc bag, zip it up, and then of course, dispose of it as soon as you could. It just is, you know, these people become isolated. They stay home because they're afraid. They're totally frustrated. They don't know what to do. Um, a lot of them are just, just give up and just become lonely, homebound people because they don't want to become embarrassed when they leak. Um, another lady told me that she was, um, she had stress incontinence and she wasn't wearing a pad and she's playing cards and they were all laughing really hard and she wet all over the place. Um, horrible, horrible, horribly embarrassing for her. So when you think about urinary incontinence, we can laugh about some of it. I mean, there's some of it that we all find funny, but when you think about the people that are actually going through this loss of dignity, this the, the shameful feelings that they get when they just really don't know what to do and, and if they think on somebody's couch or something. So just keep that in mind with your patients that it is a huge, huge problem for them, the psychosocial issues surrounding this. So we're going to talk about what is normal, because like I said, you got to know what's normal before you understand what's abnormal. And this is, I just want you to know, this is what I would teach my patients. This is how I would teach the patients what they're going through and how to deal with it. So it's not, it's not, um, well, it may be to teach nurses too, but it's mostly to teach my patients what to deal, what they're dealing with. So normally we have a brain and a spinal cord and a bladder. And what happens is as the bladder's filling, these little blue dots signify the nerves, the nerves become exposed to urine. And with that exposure, that's when the message is sent to the brain that says, hey, I'm full. Now all this goes through the spinal cord. And then the brain says, bladder, not now, it's not socially acceptable to avoid yet. So keep those gates shut and tighten those muscles. And then of course, when you get into the bathroom and you get ready to go, then the gates open and the bladder, uh, the detrusor muscle actually just contracts and then the urine can come out because those gates are now open, which is the pelvic floor muscles. So it's important, as you can see here with normal voiding, it's very important to be able to control the closure 
of the pelvic floor muscles as well as the opening of the pelvic floor muscles. So keep that in mind as we go through pelvic muscle exercises. So stress incontinence, of course, we have a brain and spinal cord and bladder. As the bladder fills, it tells the brain it's full. The brain says, not now, keep those gates closed, tighten those muscles. However, the intra-abdominal pressure is greater than the pelvic floor muscles strength, so that causes the leakage. So the muscles just can't hold it in when the intra-abdominal pressure gets greater, such as when you cough, sneeze, laugh, or you know any of those type, lifting up something, anything that increases the intra-abdominal pressure, that can cause leakage with stress incontinence. So like I said, the symptoms of stress incontinence are the cough, laugh, squirt club. That's the coughing, laughing, straining, even just reaching high up in a cupboard for something can cause you to have that type of leaking. Um, sneezing, running, anything like that. So as you can see in these pictures, um, you know, any one of these things, these things can cause the leakage. I like this. This is a very old little cartoon that's been around forever and ever, and it's called Mini Paws. That's her name. And it says, thank God for all the years I've been doing my kegels as she's standing there in the grocery store sneezing. I love that mini pause. <laughs> and as you can see the girl on the right, holding her legs closed. This is, we used to call the potty dance. You know, you're trying to keep those muscles closed. It's, sometimes it's very difficult for people. So urgency. I love this part because it, it's really interesting how you can well we'll go through how you can train the bladder but it's it's really interesting with the urgency so you still have the brain the spinal cord and the bladder but you for some reason get this false message that says that you're ready to go and of course the brain is saying no 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 not now we can't do that keep those gates closed tighten the muscles However, the gates open because of the pressure pushed from the detrusor muscle. So the detrusor muscle is actually squeezing when you don't want it to because of that false message. These symptoms of urge incontinence are so real. And you see people running to the bathroom or you might do it yourself, running to the bathroom. Um, there's triggers, different triggers that cause it. Um, there's a strong sudden need to urinate and that followed by that bladder contraction, which results in leakage. If you have really strong pelvic floor muscles, sometimes you can keep from leaking with urgency, um, but it's very difficult. So this is the gotta go, gotta go, gotta go now syndrome. And I had a patient one time who um, she couldn't walk into one of the big stores. I think she was talking about Lowe's or whatever. She'd walk in and see a toilet. As soon as she saw that toilet, she had that strong urge and she couldn't hold it. So therefore she couldn't go anywhere where there was toilets. Imagine that you go into most of your hardware stores and you see a toilet or you see a picture of one like this one. So you see this man, this is a great truck. I love it. It's been around a long time, this picture has. And, but people with urgency, oh yeah, it's gonna make them run to the bathroom. That is unfair for that guy to do that, but it is a great advertisement for his plumbing services. Okay, what is mixed stress and urge? Obviously the brain, the spinal cord, the bladder, you get the false message. The brain thinks they're full, but I mean, the brain tells the bladder not yet. Close the gates, bladder thinks it's ready to go. And lo and behold, the message is sent prematurely that makes the muscles, or that makes the detrusor muscles squeeze down, but the muscles are too weak to stop the urine. So therefore you have a mixture of stress and urge. Very difficult to treat but it can be done. Overflow incontinence is another type where there's frequent or constant dribbling. And usually that's because the bladder's not emptying all the way. I call it just peeing off the top. They go in, they urinate, they don't empty all the way. Um, and then 
in no time at all, they're full again, and then they get this, this leakage that just drips, dribble, dribble, dribble. They may need to urinate often, but they have trouble usually starting the flow and then trouble completely emptying. So here you have urine left in the bladder. These people do get a lot of infection as well. If you have somebody with um, acute or chronic retention, that is a, they need to be referred. BPH um, after anti-incontinent surgery with a snug outlet, that's difficult. If they have prolapse or strictures in the urethra, foreign objects, um, neurogenic causes, these people need to go to see a urologist. They're gonna need to have some, some further testing done and, and possibly some surgery done. So for overflow incontinence, first you're gonna check for fecal impaction. Um, a lot of people, a lot of elderly especially, get impacted and then it pushes on the bladder. It makes it so that they can't hold their urine, they can't empty all the way. Enlarged prostate does the same thing. Um, they may have to have a TERP. Um, and then intermittent catheterization can help with these people with overflow so that they're emptying all the way. There are medications that can improve the empty, emptying and reduce the blockage. And that would be your alpha um, adrenergic antagonist. Functional urinary incontinence is that that usually happens with elderly people who have to get up to go to the bathroom. And we're talking grandma who has to grab her walker. She has the urge to go, so she grabs her walker and slowly moves it over and then slowly pushes with her hands to get up. And right then she probably will leak. Um, it's urine loss due to the inability to get to the bathroom related to immobility or altered cognitive function. So it most often coexists with other types of urinary incontinence. Normally, they have a normal lower tract, though. So these people just basically can't get there fast enough. So it's really hard. And how do you tell somebody who is not cognitively able to um, do this? There's, we'll talk about some ways that you can help these people with functional incontinence as well. So environmental assessment, you look around and you say, okay, how can we get this patient to the bathroom or this grandmother, whoever, to the bathroom faster? You may need to have a bedside commode there, which would help because then they don't have to go as far. Um, also, things like don't drink anything after six o'clock at night because then you don't have to get up in the middle of the night so many times. Um, toileting programs, increased time to walk to the bathroom. Some and we'll go into the timed voidings. I'll talk about that in a minute, but that really helps too. Um, and of course, with these people, you're going to do preventative skin care and use absorptive products for them. Um, you can actually make sure, like clothing modifications. I've had some patients that I completely I had them go to a seamstress, get rid of the buttons on your pants, get some Velcro pants. Um, make sure you've got adequate lighting in the bathroom so you can actually get there without tripping on those rugs that you're going to get rid of. I mean, there's all kinds of things for um, the environmental adaptations that you really need to do with these older people so they don't fall and break a hip. And um, it's, it's so important to change everything. External collection devices are really good for some of them. If they absolutely cannot get to the bathroom, save them the, the horror of having wet pads or whatever and put on an external collection device. Um, and we went over a lot of those in our last, in the last lecture on incontinence, um, I mean on catheters, so you can refer to that if you need to. So routine toileting, our routine scheduled toileting. This is what I was talking about with the elderly. What is really nice to do is have a predetermined schedule. Usually it's two to four hours apart. The staff or caregiver focuses on, on the patient versus the patient focus. Most long-term um, facilities will have uh, long-term care patients are candidates for the uh, routine scheduled toileting. Appropriate candidates include cognitively impaired, 
people who you need to really help to go, but they have to be cooperative and um, unable to communicate the need to void or defecate. So you put them on this timing, this timing, and or if they lack motivation to be continent, just put them on a, on a schedule and you'd be surprised how their bladders will adapt to that schedule. And as long as you watch the intake and you can keep them dry sometimes that way, it's very helpful. Um, as far as treatments are concerned, there's a variety of treatments that can help with incontinence, medication, bladder training, surgery, catheterization, either long or short term. Um, there's pads or pelvic floor muscle exercises, and we'll go over some of those as well. So for specific problems, um, for stress urinary incontinence, you want to teach pelvic muscle exercises. Provide toileting assistance and bladder training. Consider referral to other team members of meds or surgery as warranted if they need to have meds or if they need to have surgery. Uh, and then urinary or uh, urge incontinence. Implement bladder training or habit training. And again, pelvic muscle exercises. Pelvic muscle exercises are extremely important for many, many reasons, um, which we'll go over some of those in just a few minutes. Pharmacological treatments, I am not crazy about, although sometimes it's necessary, the anticholinergics to calm the overactive bladder, that can help a little bit with urge. And you can see them listed here, Ditropan, Detrol, Enablix, um, Tobias, Vesicare, Sanctura. There, there are many different ones and it depends on that would be a urology or a urology's department decision on the pharmacological part. Uh, there's also the alpha alpha blockers for men with urge to overflow or overflow incontinence, Flomax, all of those you see listed there. Um, so you want to treat the urge incontinence, relax the bladder muscle, and this Mirabagron, or however you say it can um, increase the amount held and increase the amount urinated. But it basically helps to empty the bladder better, and that helps with the leakage. Um, one thing I just learned recently that I did not know is that they also use Flomax for people with, including women, with, um, with stones, um, a ureteral stone they gave Flomax for that. And um, apparently it helps quite a bit. All right, we're gonna get into some behavioral techniques. And while we're doing this, I want you to try to do it yourself because the best way that you can teach somebody else is to know how to do it yourself effectively. And the added plus to that is it will help your pelvic floor muscles. So talking about the bladder training, this is when we delay the urination after you get the urge. So for people with urge incontinence, for instance, you want to delay when you get that urge. Don't run to the bathroom because that's going to make you be trained to leak when you get there. So hold off for 10 minutes after you feel that urge. The goal is to lengthen to two and a half to three and a half hours between voidings if possible. And then there's people who don't empty well and we need to do double voiding. That helps the bladder, helps them learn to empty the bladder completely and that helps to avoid the overflow incontinence. So what I would tell my patients is go ahead and urinate. And if they're women, urinate, wipe yourself, stand up, and then sit right back down again and open those gates again so that you can urinate a little bit more. And with men, the same thing. Stop. When you think you're done, you're going to just stop, look in the mirror, do whatever, fix your hair, whatever, and then turn around and go again. And that helps to empty the bladder. The bladder is tricked to think it has to go twice. More behavioral techniques are scheduled voiding trips, scheduled toilet trips, sorry. Um, urinate every two to four hours rather than waiting until you need to go. And this is really good what I was talking about with elderly, every two hours, every two to four hours, take them in to go. Fluid and diet management is very important. You wanna not take caffeine or acidic foods or uh, alcohol, 
cut back or avoid those completely because that is a bladder irritant and that can cause that urgency. Reduce the liquid consumption, especially after six o'clock at night. After six o'clock at night, I mean, they should drink as much water or fluids as they need up until six o'clock. After six o'clock, no fluids in. Um, it really does help. And also losing weight or increasing physical activity can help as well. Pessaries are really, really um, an old treatment that has been around for a long time. They're inserted into the vagina like tampons and they press against and support the urethra multiple types for multiple types of incontinence. As you can see up here, the ring is for mild first degree uterine prolapse for a cystocele. And then the cube, the cube is for second um, or third degree uterine prolapse and they remove them, those have to be removed every night. The donut is for third degree prolapse and it's not to be deflated during insertion or removal. The dish, that's for stress urinary with a mild prolapse. Shots is for pro, uh, prolapse complicated by a mild cystocele, and I'll show you what that looks like in just a minute. The gel horn is for a uh, third degree prolapse, and the ring with the knob is for stress urinary incontinence. I find it interesting that there's so many different shapes and sizes, but you know we are not all alike. And when they do that vaginal um, exam, a professional can usually tell which one you need to have. And then once you put that in, it really does help with different types of, of incontinence. There's also injections that you can get that um, synthetic, there's many different kinds, but I'll just touch on this. The synthetic materials are injected into the tissue around the, ureth uh, around the urethra and that support and tightening of the bladder neck is happening. Um, it's injected through a very thin needle from a scope inserted into the urethra and it takes less than 20 minutes to do, but it also may take um, two or three more injections to get the desired results. And with the desired results, you're not going to get a complete cure of incontinence usually. Um, it may improve the symptoms. And you can see here how the, the bladder comes down and then of course there's the urethra and there's the sphincter. The bulking agent is injected through so that it helps to um, decrease the size of that urethra. It helps to hold the urine in a little bit better. And then again, there's catheterization. For severe incontinence, a lot of times they will put in a suprapubic catheter. Um, may need intermittent catheterization for retention or a condom cath for overflow um, or male incontinence. And also, again, you can refer to the webinar on SHIELD from October 24th when we discuss all the different types of catheters. Surgical procedures can help. Um, there's a multiple, there's multiple surgical procedures, but um, the more traditional are the retropubic suspension, needle bladder neck suspension, the anterior vaginal repair, sling procedures, bulking injections, um, periurethral like I just showed you, and artificial urinary sphincters for male and female. Uh, newer approaches are the tension-free vaginal tapings and the monarch sling. So I wanna tell you a little funny story. It's kind of funny. I had these patients that, I had a patient who was a male. He was quite elderly, but they were just dead set that he was going to become continent of urine. And this was, I believe, post-prostatectomy. Um, his wife was just such a cute little tiny thing, and he was a really tall, rather, rather big guy. And um, they chose to have an artificial urinary sphincter put in. Well, if you know anything about those, you know that there's one kind that has the balloon that is in the scrotum. And that's where the pump is, to pump up the balloon, to tighten around the ureter, to cause them to be continent. 
Well, in order to urinate, this person needs to be able to squeeze that little ball to make it so that it opens up and lets them urinate. Well, she tells this story and it just, it cracked me up. I laughed so hard. We were at a support group meeting and she told everybody this story, how she, they were flying. They were in an airplane and he had to urinate. It was time. And you really have to time it when you have your uh, artificial sphincter. So he went into the little bathroom and he could not, undo that he couldn't reach it or something so here's this little tiny female squishing in there with this great big guy in this little tiny bathroom reaching down there trying to squeeze that ball to open up that sphincter so he could urinate and she said she pushed against the door and the door opened they didn't have it locked it was hilarious how she told the story but that goes to show what people will go through to become continent. And that man, he worked hard to use that. It Eventually, he couldn't do it himself. And she had to go into the bathroom with him every time. So it turned out to be quite a hassle for her. But um, a lot of people will turn to those artificial sphincters, especially younger people. For him, I don't know if it was a good idea. Uh, vaginal sling procedures. They are, have been around a long time. They can use tissue from your own body or tissue from cadaver body or from a pig or a cow. There is the mesh synthetic kind. Um, and they either put you under spinal or general anesthesia and the catheter um, is placed in your bladder at the time to drain your bladder while they do that. So I will show you one in just a minute, but the vaginal sling is actually there's one small incision made inside the vagina and another one just above the pubic hair the pubic hair line or in the groin most procedures done right through the cut in the vagina so you can see here um, the vaginal sling procedure is done here and i like this picture it shows it very very well this sling is made from tissue or synthetic material it's passed under the urethra and the bladder neck, and it's attached to the strong tissues in the lower uh, portion of your abdomen, or it's left in place to let the body heal around it and incorporate um, into the tissue. So you can see how that would hold up that, that urethra a little bit, which helps tilt the bladder to where you have some closure there. There are side effects, just like with everything else. Um, discomfort, you can have constipation, um, temporary bleeding with that, irritation of the site of the incision, um, minor pain. The birch procedure, this is my favorite. Um, part of the uh, urethra nearest to the bladder is restored to its normal position using a few stitches on either side of the urethra to hold it up. I think this is a very successful one from what I've been reading. Um, and I like this picture because it really does show exactly what's happening there. Um, but anything to help close that urethra. When the muscles get, and you can see the pelvic muscles here, right below this, the uh, sutures that are there, you see those two little marks. That is the pelvic muscle showing where the pelvic muscles are. And if you can increase that strength there, you wouldn't have to have a birch procedure. You can get it too tight and um, the patient can, it can make it so they can't even urinate at all. So let's talk about overactive bladder, behavioral urge inhibition, suppression. Pelvic muscle exercises are wonderful for this. E-STEM. Um, Fluid and diet changes are really important for overactive bladder and bladder training. You can also, like I said, get medications to relax the bladder. And again, the modification of the fluid intake, oh my goodness, it's so important. There are people who can't eat tomatoes, who can't use artificial sweeteners or sugar. Milk products can be an irritant. Um, citrus juices and of course alcohol, carbonated drinks, and definitely caffeinated drinks. Um, I know that there's a lot of people out there with urgency because of all this caffeine intake that's been going on with all the coffee places that are open. Um, but moderation, of course, is the key. It's best to just drink plenty of plain 
water. And I know a lot of people like their coffee, but if you have urgency and you're still going down to Starbucks or wherever and getting your coffee, that's not helping you any at all. So how do we inhibit the urge? Um, the urge starts slowly and it peaks and then it goes away. So never, again, never run to the toilet when you're feeling the urgency. Stop, do not move, squeeze the pelvic muscles quickly three to four times and breathe. Exhale slowly, relax and distract yourself. Count backwards from 100 by 10s or something to totally distract you from what you're feeling. And, you know, your phone's a good distractor. Get on your phone. Start texting somebody. But once that urge is gone, then you walk slowly to the bathroom and then urinate. So it's freeze, squeeze, and breathe. That's very, very important to inhibit that urge. And once you start doing that, then eventually it won't be happening anymore. Now, people use pads. A lot of women feel more comfortable with pads than anything else, like the big pull-ups or something. Um, they do have side effects. Urethritis, um, like I said before, difficulty with disposal. You know, a lot of people will get urinary tract infections or yeast. Um, but again, they're more comfortable. And if you look out there in the public, one in three women are wearing some form of pad. So in my in-person lectures, I would be going dry, dry, wet, dry, dry, wet, just to show in one room of people, mostly women at these lectures, they, one in three are wearing something. And it's sad because there's ways to keep from doing that. One of them is right here, this pelvic floor muscle picture. I love this picture. I've used it for many, many years. Um, and you can see here on the left-hand side, the ones that's pelvic floor muscles before exercise, you can see how they're kind of going downward. And you know, down there doesn't count. It needs to be strong up towards the top part of the urethra where it's up towards the bladder neck. Strong pelvic muscles hold on the bladder neck and keep the urethra closed. You can see that on the right-hand side. Um, and you can actually tell with patients when you work with them how strong they are. Of course, we keep a bladder diary so you know exactly what's going on. But you can also you can also tell that they've been doing them by how they do them when they're in the office. Sometimes, especially with biofeedback, you can tell that their muscles are way stronger than they used to be by doing the pelvic muscle exercises. So men and women both, we used to have a continence clinic that um, we had a post or a pre-prostatectomy program for um, men. And they would come in and they would have some biofeedback prior to having their prostate removed so that their pelvic floor muscles are nice and strong before they go in for surgery. And then once they go to surgery and they're healed enough, then they come back and we continue with that. And I have seen a huge difference in how those pelvic floor muscles work before and after. If they get before prostatectomy treatment with PME, then they are much better afterwards as far as leakage. And I can speak from, and I have permission to do this, I can speak from my husband's um, um, situation. He had prostate cancer at age 41. Well, as soon as we knew he had prostate cancer, we, we were already doing the clinic. So we started working with him with um, biofeedback to learn where those muscles were and to get him strengthened. And then he went and had his um, radical prostatectomy with nerve sparing, hope, you know, we hoped. And it was pretty successful. And afterwards, he did the exercises again. And he has had no problem except when he forgets to tighten before he lifts something. So I'm here to tell you, it really works before and after. So how do you accomplish this? Um, with moderate stress and or urge, or like I said, pre-prostatectomy, you want to do pelvic muscle exercises for four to 12 weeks. During that time, 25% are cured and 
while 75% report a 50% improvement. So even if you're not cured, you're using half the pads. And we used to do pad counts with our patients to where they would come in one week and say, yeah, I'm using eight pads a day. And then after four to 12 weeks of doing their, their pelvic floor muscle exercises, oh yeah, I'm only using one pad a day. You know, it's definitely improved. And if you can cut out a couple of pads a day to some of these people, that's huge. That's huge. So how do you accomplish this? There are independent programs, teaching, coaching, there's CDs out there, there's, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of stuff online, biofeedback assisted, um, work with a coach. There's vaginal weights that you can use for women. Best candidates are ones that have intact anatomic support. Uh, you know, basically you have to have innervation too. If you don't have your nerves there, then you don't have a way to contract. Um, and they can't have a really significant prolapse either because then it's just not gonna work. So recommend a graduated strength training program. They have to learn to identify the muscles first. Strengthen the muscles. They have to learn the knack. And the neck is really good for anybody. So how do you identify that muscle? First of all, during a vaginal or rectal exam, the coach or the nurse is going to ask the patient to squeeze around the finger. If they can feel that, great. You say, yes, that's the right muscles to use. You're doing great. Avoid holding your breath, bearing down, using accessory muscles or anything like that. I used to tell my patients, to feel their abdomen when they tighten up their pelvic floor muscles. And if their abdomen is poking out at all, then they're using their muscles that they shouldn't use. Try to interrupt the stream. And I tell them only do that once, just, you know, maybe once a day, just to get uh, the feel of those muscles when they interrupt the stream. You don't want to do that constantly because that confuses the bladder. So, do not do the exercises during urination. That's not a good time to do it. So with biofeedback, it's pretty easy to identify them. With electrical stimulation, it really, really helps. Um, there's things you can do with like a ball between the knees to abduct or adduct, and then also the resistance with an exercise band to adduct um, or abduct, sorry. Um, that's what's best for the long-term care of residents. So ultimately, 10 Kegels with a 10-second contraction and a 10-second relaxation. That's what you're working up to. It's not going to happen right away for patients. They're going to have to start out with a two-second hold and a two-second relaxation. And remember, relaxation is just as important as tightening. So do this three times a day in different positions, sitting, standing, lying. You don't want to use your abs or your glutes, and you don't want to hold your breath. So I have to tell you one more funny thing. I hope I have time for this, but I was teaching in a church, and I was teaching the women how to do these pelvic floor muscle exercises. And it was so cute because there was a lot of elderly um, ladies in this class, and um, I taught them how to do it, and then I told them. So if we're in church and I see you bobbing up and down, I know you're using your glutes. So this little old lady, she must have been 90 something. She was sitting ahead of me, like two rows ahead of me. And during church, she turned around and looked at me and winked. And then she bobbed up and down like that, like I'm doing them. But anyway, it was so cute. But I did teach her how, and it did help her decrease her pad usage. So that was the biggest thing for her. Um, there's no standardized exercise protocol. However, the goal of the program is to enhance endurance and increase the strength. So we have type one fibers and we have type two muscle fibers. The type one fibers are the fast twitch, fast twitch. That's where you tighten real quick and it tightens really good. And then the slow twitch is, is the one that actually works for endurance. So that's why we do quick flicks, which is type one, and that's why we do the tighten and hold to promote the endurance. 
the neck, the neck is when you have a quick, strong contractions of the pelvic floor muscle. So immediately before you cough, lift, or squeeze, that's when you're going to quickly tighten up your pelvic floor. This is what my husband has to do when he lifts things. He bends down, gets ready to lift, and then he tightens, and then he lifts, and that keeps him from um, losing any urine during that time. Prevents or reduces leakage during activity. If you're gonna sneeze, tighten first before you sneeze if you can. Um, it really, really works. But you have to be able to do pelvic muscle exercises correctly in order to do the neck. For women, there's weighted vaginal cones that they can use. And you start with the lightest one, put it in, go about your business in the morning. I tell them just put it in, walk around, make your bed, whatever, go in and do your hair, whatever. And do that two or three times a day. Um, not that you have to do your hair two or three times a day, but walk around with it for a little bit, like 15 minutes. And when you can hold that one lightest one for 15 minutes, then you advance to the next weight. And there's five weights. By the time you get to the fifth one, if you can hold that thing in for 15 minutes, you've got some pretty strong muscles. So acute prolapse, um, that causes incomplete emptying. And I'm gonna show you some of the pictures or some of the prolapse pictures here that are very interesting. Look at A. On A, you can see um, that the pelvic organs are normally supported. That is normal. I'm gonna use the mouse, so you're gonna see a cursor on here, but you can see A, how this is really good support in here. Everything is where it should be, okay? And on B, there's a uterine prolapse, but there's good support anterior and, um, anterior and posterior vaginal walls. So it actually looks pretty good support here, but yet that, that uterus is coming down. C, the uterus is up, but you have a cystocele and a rectocele, but you have the really good uterine support. So you see the bladder, how it's hanging down this way, that's your cystocele, and the rectum is coming in this way, that's your rectocele. So, and you can tell that this person can barely empty their bladder because it's, it's really hanging down. So that can be a big problem. And then D is the post hysterectomy vault prolapse with an introseal. And that's where you have some, some of your bowel is hanging down in there because the uterus is gone and there's this empty space. So you can see on those pictures, the different types of prolapse. And if you have this, you can do really good pelvic floor muscle exercises. This, they're not gonna work for you very much. You're gonna have to have a A&P repair here. Um, you can correct this, at least become continent, but you're, you're not gonna be able to get your uterus all the way back up in there. You may have to even push it back up in there, which is what some people have to do. Urethral um, are occlusive devices for men. They used to have these archaic penile clamps that were just horrible. They looked like, oh, they were just really archaic. They looked brutal. Um, now they have better ones. Different companies are making them. And one of the things that I saw that I was really interested in is the anti-cuff by GT Uro Urological. It's not pictured up here, but it's a little bag that has a, it's almost like those coin purses that you squeeze the two sides together and they open up. It, it kind of snaps shut. And so they put it over the penis and it catches in a urine, but it also helps to squeeze the urethra so that they don't leak as much. The picture on the right is a prolapsed, um, not prolapsed, I'm sorry, retracted penis pouch that we would we would put over a retracted penis in order to um, gather the urine that way. By the way, these people have to have intact cognition because if you put one of these clamps on somebody who doesn't realize that they need to go and take it off and urinate, they're gonna have a really bad problem with their bladder. So again, identify the muscles, may need to stop the stream to find it, but only do that once. I also have taught my patients to, I've told my, my female patients, you know, if you are in the shower, go ahead and put your finger in the vagina, tighten on your finger. You can tell where your muscles are that way. That's the best way to do it. 
The other way I have to say is during intercourse, because you can tell when, you're, when your muscles are working good, you will be able to tell. Um, but don't tighten the abdomen or the buttocks. You wanna pull up like stopping a stream. Some people talk about pulling up like an elevator, you know, thinking about you're pulling the pelvic floor muscles up like an elevator. So you wanna tighten and relax in five seconds and out five seconds, which means you have to be able to relax that pelvic floor muscle as well. A lot of people with um, problems with constipation, it's, it's just incredible how this will help people with constipation because a lot of people and kids especially, I used to work with kids with uh, fecal incontinence and their biggest problem was they had megacolon because they never wanted to go to the bathroom for whatever reason. Sometimes it was, um, well, there could be physical reasons, but a lot of times it's psychological. So I would do pelvic floor muscle exercises with them using a machine that actually was made for children that had things like a, um, like for the, for the boys, it had like a um, landing zone or whatever for this, for this um, spaceship. And you could see that when you squeeze on that probe that's in the rectum, it will bring that spaceship to the landing zone. It was really, really, really neat. And But what I found is these kids were trying to defecate with a closed door. In other words, they're tightening up so tight and they, they can't push through that closed door. And, and adults do the same thing. So in terms of pelvic floor muscle exercises, it's very, very important to have that relaxation as well. Some people only need that relaxation when it talks of fecal incontinence. Urinary incontinence, you need to be able to squeeze and close that door as well as relax to urinate. So continue three times a day, increasing it to 10 seconds. Like I said, you're gonna start at two, go to three. If you can hold it for that three seconds without losing you know, that strength, and then go on to four and you work up to 10. Once you get to 10, you want to hold it for 10, relax for 10, and do at least 10 repetitions three times a day for maintenance. And I used to tell my patients, you cannot eat breakfast, lunch, or dinner until you do your exercises. And that was with my elderly, that was a way for them to remember when they needed to do them. And sometimes they had to set a, um, they had to set a timer because they, you know, an alarm because they would forget what they needed to do. So the references are all here for you. And thank you to Deb Thayer. She's wonderful. And also the, um, oh gosh, there's so many that have done so much work with urology. So that ends my part. And thank you very much for listening. All right. Thank you so much, Kelly. That was a great presentation. Very informative. Um, really appreciate all your insights and knowledge on that. Um, just to, as a reminder to attendees, um, you, you will uh, receive CE uh, credits for this presentation. Um, Capital Nursing will email um, the CE information to you within five to seven business days. Be sure to check your spam folder. Um, if you, if you have, if you have any questions, you can feel free to reach out to capitalnursingeducation at gmail.com. Um, before we leave, I want to tell you about a couple more things. Um, we'd really like to invite you to visit our online community. It's at shieldhealthcare.com slash community. Um, there's a lot of great resources for both patients and clinicians alike. Um, we, have, we usually get about 100,000 unique visitors a month and we update the site daily. So there's a lot of great information out there. Um, one thing that we are promoting right now is our annual caregiver contest. Um, this is really opportunity that we, we have to celebrate caregivers and all the hard work that, um, that they, that they uh, bring. Um, this year we're really asking for caregivers to really give us your, your best tips for care at home. We'd, we'd love to get your entries about 150 words or more um, and you'd be entered, entered to win one of three $250 gift cards. So we can pay you back for all your, your great insights and your hard work. Um, 
while you're checking out our uh, website, our blog, uh, we invite you to also to request copies of some great resources that we have for both patients and clinicians, such as our Living Well Anatomy Guide, Wound Management Guide, um, as well as our Living Well with Incontinence Guide, which is what you're going to see second from the right. Um, it does cover a lot of the information, or some of the information that Kelly um, discussed, plus other um, product information and um, other lifestyle tips as well. Um, last thing before we go is, if you do, if you would like to to use this webinar um, with your agency, you're welcome to do it. Um, you can uh, feel free to contact us or Capital Nursing if you have any questions. Our contact information is marketing at shieldhealthcare.com. And once again, Capital Nursing is Capital Nursing Education at gmail.com. Um, so at this point, I'd like to open it up for a couple of questions. Uh, we are closing in on that one hour mark, um, but we did have some, some good questions come in during um, the presentation. So um, Kelly, if you don't mind, I'd like to, to uh, relay these questions on behalf of, of our attendees. Um, here's the first one that we did get in. Um, my father has a catheter. Is it safe for him to clean his, his bag every day with bleach and water? Hmm. I don't think it's necessary to do it every day with bleach and water. And usually we would use a little bit of, of vinegar in there as, instead of bleach. Um, and usually every, I would think every three to five days, Okay. And again, again, that information, if that person is interested in going back to our last, um, go online and go to our last uh, webinar that was about catheters, because there's a lot of information she could use for her dad on that one. Got it. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, the next one is, um, the person I care for refuses to discuss his incontinence. Um, I can't get a word in when I bring it up. He just leaves the room. What what kind of suggestions would you have? That is so typical, so typical of men especially. Women are pretty good at talking about it, but right. men are very, very, it's embarrassing for them. It's very embarrassing. What I did for a patient that I had that was like that, actually it's a family member and I won't say who, I actually went and bought some of the um, pads for men, which are guards. And I went and bought them and I put them in his bathroom. And I didn't, I didn't try. I mean, I know with him, there is no way he's going to do any exercises. There's no way he's going to discuss it with me at all. There's nothing that he will say about it. So I simply put guards in his bathroom with instructions how to use them. And then it's up to him. Because some some people you you can't talk to about it at all. They just don't want to. So just have it available, and maybe even one of the brochures offline there. Have it available in his bathroom so he can look at it at his leisure, and he can use those pads. Um, the other thing is to mention about how I mean I don't know what the situation is, but in my situation I was doing the laundry. And so it was like, okay, um, I see that there's been three or four pairs of pants that were wet. So may I suggest that you use some of these guards and it will cut down on the cost of your laundry. So things like that. You can't push them though. Got it. All right, well, well thank you Kelly for your insights on that. Um, there are some additional questions, but we'll, we'll send them out to uh, send them out your way so we can Get them back to the folks who, who asked them. Um, no but um, all folks attending, we really appreciate um, you taking the time to join us today for this, for this really informative webinar. Um, again, we, we have recorded, so it will be available later for review. Um, okay. But that concludes our presentation today. Uh, we look forward to hosting Capital Nursing again on future webinars, and hopefully you guys would have the opportunity to attend as well. So thank you so much. Great. Thank you.